Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, Mark Fletcher, the uh, Next Gen 911 track chair for IAT. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion on location technologies, where it's going, what we're going to be doing with this, and we've assembled a uh, panel of experts here to discuss this. Henning Shulsrini from Columbia, Carol Davids, who runs a program here at IIT. Mark Grady, who we just heard from, who's the founder of InDigital. And Walt Magnuson from Texas A&M, who's been doing work on IP location for about as long as work has been doing, being done out there. So let's start off with just the state of the state. Walt, what um, you were one of the original conjurers of, of IP location. Uh, where do you see the industry today? Well, by the way, um, I'm following along behind Henning's footsteps, so he was, he was in this way, way before I was, so it, uh, I don't want don't to take too much credit here. Um, you know, obviously location is a significant issue for, for anybody because there's no easy way of doing it. The, um, the, the ideas of trying to do it via, out, via outdoor location sensors and beacons Obviously, it doesn't work because we've gone ahead and we've we've incorporated, um, in essence, Faraday cages are, are what we're building for buildings now. So we can no longer get any RF signal into buildings at all. So we have to have something that's internally generated. Putting beacons throughout a building is expensive. Um, triangulation off of access points is great as long as you know the location of the access point. So we've got significant t technical issues for every mechanism, but yet there's a strong desire and a need to get it done because. Um, NG911 is location-based routing, and until we have, until we have a good location, uh, we're not going to be able to solve that problem. The, the other thing, though, that I think that we need to make sure we're keeping track of and thinking about is, you know, everything we've done in NG911 is based on getting the call to the call taker, and that's important. But now that we also have FirstNet, you've got to remember that, in essence, ultimately, that information has to be conveyable to the first responder. Because it's great that the call taker has it, but it's going to be the first responder that's actually going to be taking action on that. So you have to really deal with the entire call flow through the entire process. And that's very, very difficult because, um, because of the way the two networks are architected, because of control issues of who's managing what. So those interfaces really haven't been defined yet. Um, they have, obviously, since they haven't been defined, they haven't been tested. So we've got a long, long ways to go in that space. But in essence, this concept of a dispatchable location where, you know, what I'm hearing basically is about a meter, that's hard to get. That's, that's hard to really get down to that level of, of, of refinement. But that's what we're all shooting for. Mark, you could take the easy out and say, see my last session, yeah. but I'm not going to let you do that. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's room for innovation in what's being done today to try to improve it. I, you know, our goal has always been, by whatever means there is available, to improve the quality of service. I mean, uh, the, the limitation as I see it right now is that the service providers have got to have an incentive. They've got to have a, a, you know, a, a set deadline or a goal in order to make improvements within their networks. And they have to have vendors that sell them equipment that make that possible. And that's the real barrier that we've got right now. We just don't have that innovation at the carrier level the originating service provider level to make better location information available. It's not a priority for them. They've got contract sales agents that just put anything on the service app they want, and that gets processed by the system. Uh, I mean, we've had num a number of uh, issues over the years where a tower location doesn't even have a civic address, it just has a township. You know, a township's a pretty big jurisdiction in most of the states. That's not going to get us to the person that we want to see. Carol, as an innovator of the tech? <laughs> well, you know, our lab has uh, focused on indoor location for the last probably three or four years. And uh, that was in response to the, uh, the decision by the, the major carriers in response to the FCC's mandate that they be able to provide indoor location in tall buildings in particular. So, uh, and the... Uh, the, the carriers themselves said that this, they would do this with using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or a combination of the two. So that's where our, our work has focused. 
And uh, we've got a, uh, you know, we have infrastructure actually deployed on this campus and we have, you know, demo demonstrations that we can get within several meters. So we're there and we can get you on the correct floor. And we, we have the z-axis, but we do the z-axis by a you know, weighted average of the floors of all the reporting beacons. So what we did is we said invest in fairly inexpensive infrastructure. And this certainly at this point in time is doable by enterprise. And the NEAD theoretically is going to make it possible for all these database entries that we have on our enterprise or our campus network would certainly make it possible to, to give all that information to a, to a NEAD. So uh, I think what, what we see is enterprises can make these decisions, uh, but how will this become part of a service uh, that's, you know, that's, that's nationwide? So, and we've worked with the, the NEAD, you know, we've, we've worked with NEAD to some extent, but, but right now I think that, that is there a mandate? Will somebody say if you own a building or if you own an enterprise, are you going to then provide your maps and your uh, XY and your, your, uh, your floors? What our system does, if, if I can you know, take the moment for people who haven't heard of it, we built an application for the phone we can either do this all web RTC or all web based, uh, or we can do this legitimately going through the, uh, we can do this going through the ESINet, but we can make a SIP call uh, and the application that we use will then scan the neighborhood for uh, the, the presence of, of beacon signals. We'll record the RSSIs of those signals received and the identification of the devices sending them. We'll then send that information to our database and we use AWS. So we then process the, the set of values. This is basically two part vectors. This is the ID and this is the RSSI. We'll process that and come back using a process of trilateration and least squares fitting to get a reasonably within a meter or two usually location. We get the floor by simply taking a vote. If everybody who reported to us was on the second floor excepting one that was on the third, we assume that you're really on the second floor. <laughs> so that's, uh, we're, we're not using altitude to figure out, we're not using air pressure to figure out where you are. So, you know, this is all predicated on somebody spending the $6 per beacon to put them up, maybe depending upon your floor, you know, your floor, where are you going to put them? So it, it is dependent on you proactively putting something out there and recording its location. We also have maps, and we're able to now just pop up a point up on the map that says where you are. But, you know, just to say it is dependent upon you putting the stuff in there proactively, and if there were a NEAD, we could put this stuff into that. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and see, I mean, the, the, the original, you know, concept was the, the carriers come to us and say, could you do an application that would do this? And we build the application. We built several flavors of it, one for Wi-Fi, one for Bluetooth, and then we built one that was basically a native web on, on the phone. The native web on the phone can actually go to a WebRTC PSAP without bothering to go through the EziNet, and I'm interested in continuing to look at how does that scale and is it safe? But <laughs> so Henning, as the father of SIP, yeah. what do you got to say about your kids? <laughs> your kids. Wayward kids. <laughs> yeah, so just listening to your presentations earlier and discussion, I'm struck by how we are in well-intentioned kludge land. Uh, <laughs> namely, we have a, yeah, a mine. This is, location is not, I'm saying it's easy, but certainly between all of us, we probably, and I suspect the industry in general, have a pretty good notion as to how we can gather the data, uh, how it should be distributed, maybe as to what the structure would be. 
But what we have not managed is beyond kind of initial efforts like Vineyard, which are probably, um, I think they were never quite thought through how they would fit into an overall system. It was the, let me do something, and when I was around when Vineyard was proposed between Apple and uh, Nina and the CARE CTA, I, and another, it's that, well, we'll do a database so we get the FCC out of our back, uh, and we'll worry about the details later. Well, it's now, what, five years later? And as far as I know, there's no real good mechanism to inject data in it. There's really no good notion to use the data in a way that allows um, triangulation as opposed to the notion that I register access points somehow and whatever. Um, so, and we don't have a good mechanism of improving data quality uh, in general. And I think that we, and as you might, uh, talked about, we can do individual heroic efforts, but they're hard to scale. Uh, as in, um, if you have a system where you want three, four, five nines of predictability, as you just can't afford not to have accurate location, relying on individual companies to do that one by one without a mechanism is just a recipe for really bad things happening. So I think we, as much as we can do on improving individual things and hoping that Apple and Google and whoever else will do that, is a mechanism that relies on our location system for, as you said, a company without a business model uh, who happens to step forward for whatever reason to do that temporarily on devices without a real standard and without an obligation to correct the data this is no way to run a railroad. This is, I mean, this is, I mean, it would be okay if we're talking about placing location-based advertising for near Starbucks. I mean, we are, there's one around the corner anyway, so it doesn't really matter where you are, uh, at least in populated areas. So, I, but here we, we, we're talking about different problems. So what I would like to think about, I mean, what, if that's, I mean, maybe not a discussion for today, but longer term, there needs to be a collection of entities who now have been burned enough, so the sign said this, this is, to say, hey, um, let's, if, I, mean, I mentioned that yesterday during my talk is, we have carriers who don't want to be carriers, um, who have essentially decided they're going to kind of do the minimal necessary to do 911 related thing, but really not, the heart isn't in it anymore. It's very clear, I, mean, it's, I don't see, I mean, and Comcast actually seems to be doing wanting to do more, but if you actually, your heart were into that, you would find processes because I'm sure they worry about the billing address being correct because they worry about getting paid. Somehow their service location for 911 doesn't seem to deserve the same amount of attention. As long as they've got the zip code for the credit card, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings up an interesting point. So there's, there's been a hundred blogs on Uber can find me, uh, Domino's can find me, but 911 can't. I'm guilty myself. Uh, that's because that they're using technology on the phone. I remember when Rapid SOS, when I first met Michael Martin, Hey, I've got a great idea to solve the 911 problem. Let me guess, you wrote an app. Yeah, we wrote an app. It's easy to write an app. The problem with 911 is that people don't use an app to call 911. They know the digits 911. But now there's been a radical change. So Google <laughs> announced AML a few years ago. Has that rolled out in 14 countries in the European Union? Apple announced Hilo and their relationship with Rapid SOS at NINA this year. National Next Gen 911 Clearinghouse. Your iOS phone makes an emergency call, your payload goes into their database. PSAP queries, they get your payload. When it wasn't long, Google now puts that information in there as well. I read an article that with both of those companies, contributing data covers 
0.4 percent of deployed wireless devices. Have we solved the problem for wireless? Well, okay. And the um, the fix on that, um, Fletch, I think, is basically you know you said we don't use an app to, to call 911. You know, technically, we do use an app to call 911. It's basically your dialer is an IMS client. It's it's an app running on your phone. Correct. And the FCC actually has the authority, in my view. Again, I'm not a not a regulatory attorney, but I think they do have the um, ability to go in and mandate that at least from the ingress side that that app be modified to incorporate video, to incorporate the uh, pit of flow information, to do a number of things to at least get it into the network. We did a we had a contract with this 911 office in in Texas with CSEC a couple of years ago to do a study to look at. Um, two parts two parts of the scenario. How do I get it over to NGO, over to FirstNet? Different problem. But how do I also get the service providers to bring it in? So um, we I was able to interview four of the largest service providers in the United States as a part of that study. Um, we were asked to keep the company names anonymous. But in essence, I said, you know, look, what you're doing is your customer dials 911, you immediately grab a TDM trunk, you send it over to the TDM network, it basically goes into it, it goes into an LSRG. You take even though you're SIP based, you send it over to um, to a legacy network to route it, and then it goes through routing through the legacy network. And then if it's a, an NGP SAP, you go back through another gateway to convert it back again. So I'm taking SIP, converting it to legacy, and then bringing it back to SIP again. And which obviously, as soon as you touch that legacy network, you've lost every single one of your NG capabilities. So when I talked to the service providers and said, you know, why? You've got the ability to go directly into an ESINet. Why? Why are you going on these back paths to be able to get to the PSAPs? The answer in every single case was, there's not a financial incentive to do it. There's not a regulatory mandate to do it. This really basically can, if we screw something up, we have a lot of bad press that we really don't want to deal with, and this is a risk factor that we'd really, really rather not touch. So in essence, there's no motivation, no incentive for the service providers to really, um, including obviously the wireless service providers, to sit there and, and make that leap. So that somehow has got to be incented. The only two ways possibly uh, from the location side, you know, it's obvious the FCC is never going to be able to, to mandate lo location accuracy and things like enterprise because that's overreach of their authority. But a group that does have the ability to deal with that really, quite frankly, could be the NFPA. They have the ability to write codes for buildings, and then enforcement is really done through local building inspectors. So if they were to say, all right, this is how we do location inside of a building, and NFPA pushes that, in essence, I think you would see, you could see that obviously you've got a built-in, you've got a built-in enforcement organization because You've got fire inspectors in every single city. I've tried a number of years ago, actually called the NFPA headquarters yeah. when I was at the FCC to see if I could get any traction. I didn't, when I ran out of cycles, because it seems like relatively, um, I had difficulty because when I did November, I did New and I mean, very, very bureaucratic, but it didn't seem to be kind of somebody you could talk to like, mm -hmm. uh, and give you a lay of land as to how you could work with that entity and that. And the pitch I was making at the time, which again, I didn't really have, didn't find anybody to pitch it to, was, uh, as in my, the person I talked to was some secretary or something, when, when she was polite, but not helpful. I thought, this is, they care at least as much about protecting firefighters as they care yes. about protecting the civilian citizen in the building. Uh, in, uh, and that's actually, to some extent, an opportunity which we have not leveraged, namely, yeah. is to indicate that increasingly we will need beacon-based technologies like Carol is working on uh, in that. So I mean, I've proposed this a number of years ago, and, this is, and even at that time it was a new idea, that uh, in commercial buildings, every or in buildings in general, every smoke detector and every exit sign, which every fire inspector, fire marshal looks at anyway, and which are I mean, mandated by code, mm -hmm. and it has backup power, yep. 
well, both, I mean, commercial smoke detectors and obviously others have it. I should have a beacon with a registration mechanism built in when it's easy in commercial buildings, uh, slightly higher than that. And I would actually disagree just on one point is, surprisingly, and this has happened after I left, the FCC is, and it's partially because of a congressional mandate, is that the FCC of Florida on MLTS, meaning commercial buildings, it's larger commercial buildings, actually now fairly strong. Okay. So uh, they seem to be willing to use that authority, and so there is an opportunity there to do that. But again, what I see missing is you really needed a coalition of the NFPA, of NINA, of APCO, of Rapid SOS, of Google, of um, Apple getting together and says, here, we're going to do this right. We're going to petition the FCC for a location delivery mandate, not yeah. just location accuracy mandate. We're going to make sure that the obligation of carriers to fix their look tower location within a reasonable amount of time. Um, we're going to impose a accuracy, I mean, a ability to for example, for consumers to check their records so that, or and a notification obligation so that a consumer, whatever, just all the other stuff gets a notification every year or that what is their current registered location for 911 purposes and, and here's a way to correct it. There's a deadline for fixing mistakes, whatever, give them two weeks, whatever is reasonable uh, in that. These are not hard or even burdensome things to do, as in none of these are going to bankrupt anybody. And they ensure this, like you said, they ensure the external motivation, because the internal motivation clearly seems to be lacking. And it's like, when we know, we're, when some of us teach, and you know, if you just told people, oh, you have a homework assignment, but I, you can turn it in, you can not turn it in, you can turn it in to, uh, next week, or you can turn it in three months from now, the results are fairly predictable. Uh, so. So let me let me clarify you there. So the NFPA that you referred to, based on um, submission from you actually, requires station level reporting. And NFPA, despite my objection. A, my objection and other people's objections, I don't need to know the individual location of every single device that requires a dedicated number, it requires a dedicated alley database number, and the fact that I'm sitting at cube 2C231 is not significant to the firefighter. Because without additional information, they don't know where that is. So I think NFPA is important. I think they need to be in alignment. But right now, NFPA is built around a financial model of the database providers. And that's where the language came from. And No, that's wrong, Jerry. It's not a dispatchable address. It's a dispatchable location. Definitions are important. So again, classic example of words getting twisted, right? A dispatchable location is very different than a dispatchable address. And the definitions of what those things are important, and regardless of what that NPRM says, it's a notice of proposed rulemaking. That's a proposal to the industry for comment and consideration. And this is where, again, the financial model is twisting next generation services. Well, I, I think Henning's idea, too, of looking at it, saying, okay, if the NFPA really cares about where the firemen are located, um, it's not going to be too much longer from now that you're going to pretty much have every first responder in the country either on an AT&T prioritized device 
or a Verizon prioritized device. The major reason for that is if you're currently an AT&T customer, you actually save $5 a month and get priority. So there's no reason in the world that um, there's an economic incentive to do that. But what also, what, what's also been happening is a number of people have been really implementing the um, location services and the P25 radios. That is a very, very, very costly proposition. And if I'm sitting there carrying a smartphone that can really generate my location and a P25 device that's going to cost me an arm and a leg to really get that location sucked out of it, um, then this solution obviously makes a lot more sense. And I think the big difference now is the, the ESINet enables IP connectivity, point-to-point, peer-to-peer sharing of information. I no longer have to tie a piece of data to a telephone number at a billable rate. And that's the problem with no location. It's not that we don't want to provide specific location. We want to do it cost effectively. And a great example I have is every building in Washington, it's got to be part of the fire code. You walk into any building in the main entrance, and within 15 feet of that front door is a fire alarm panel with a rough outline of the building. It's in the FCC. And there are indicators of smoke detectors, whatever, this is the area the alarm is going off. Multi-line telephone systems, emergency communication systems, whatever you want to call them, they all know where their devices are. They can provide that information. And when you tie it to phone numbers is where the billable comes into play and it becomes overly. So it's not about not providing the data. It's about providing it cost effectively. But, but, and this is one way of having a notion, one of, kind of one of a principle that works well in the internet type of model is that you allow multiple entities and then you allow federation in a reasonable way. So that you allow competition uh, in that. And the problem has been that we've had kind of a worst of both worlds. We've had the, I mean, no competition and no real financial, I mean, and all the wrong financial incentives. And in so uh, what we need, and take that with a suitable grain of salt, is we're going to just need to find a blockchain startup where everybody can deposit their location information in that. They do an ICO, and then I will have a, a solution to the problem. No, need, needless to say, that's not quite what I would really propose, but uh, what I would propose is that instead of relying on Rapid SOS and West and a few other companies to do that is that, and this actually worked quite well in, I mean, not perfectly, it has, has issues because of, broader technology is if you look at how the FCC solved the 600 megahertz TV white spaces database, they could have, and this, I don't know who made the decision, but I think I was before my time there and I was, certainly wasn't involved, but uh, they made the decision uh, instead of picking kind of a traditional kind of beauty contest or bidding or whatever, they allowed at one time, and the number has decreased because it just didn't turn out to be that big, big a market, 12 providers to provide, a, they had to apply for license, or you had to, it's fairly, uh, there's lots of paperwork involved, so it wasn't like you and I would stand up a TV white space database uh, on a whim, but it was, well, 12 companies did it, big companies, Google, Microsoft, um, some smaller ones, and more specialty ones. So if we had a model where the option was Every carrier can deliver to any of these location, certified location providers or location clearing houses, whatever you want to call it. Anybody in one of the conditions of doing that, this is exactly what the TV White Spaces database did, is they have to be queryable by everybody else on some reason. So you would do some kind of RAND terms, whatever. I mean, can, we can work this out. This is not impossible. Uh, and then you get exactly the model that West no longer has a threshold and the Relax no longer have a, uh, and Rapid SOS, I mean, I don't, they seem to be fine people, but I'm not saying we should rely on kind of some startup as a critical piece of infrastructure. Google could do it, Apple could do it, whatever. Um, and with PSOPs and you and digital, 
you would know that we would design protocols which would do a parallel query to each one of those and you would get the answers back. We can all build a system in a tad hack probably. I, we needed to and build a system that we don't have to rely on the continuing interests of any particular entity and their kind of conflicting commercial motives to do that. Uh, so I think it's, we should think beyond just how do we do location within a building is can we get to, can industry thought leaders and industry leaders get together and say here, the current approach clearly is not working let's try something different and we need to get everybody, states need to be on board as in they need to mandate performance at the state level. Uh, FCC needs to be on board. Um, the big carriers need to be on board, at least some of them, so that they can shame the rest. The industry associations need to be on board uh, to do that, but at least some subset of these is the current model is not going to get us what we want. And I think we have to keep in mind, too, we can't be taking future concepts and trying to cobble them into yesterday's technology. So the Alley database was designed to track location for a physical device that lived at a physical location at the end of a set of copper wires. Communications doesn't live there anymore. So we need a new dynamic entity to track that physical location. Um, is, it, is, is that possible? I mean, well, do we have that model? I mean, right now we're just borrowing it from the retail side, <laughs> right? It's retailers who want to know presence. You, you may need to so, I, yeah. I, 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 Right now we're just borrowing that from the retail industry. They want to know presence. So that's where a lot of this is really coming from. It's really not coming from public safety at all. At all. It's coming from retailers. So TADHAC, that came up. Well, what, what happened in TADHAC? So that's exactly what I was going to say. So, and it wasn't just in tad hack. It's over and over again. Hackers are trying to solve this problem. But it, somebody here, Hackers from an innovative hack, No, I mean, I mean right. good guys. <laughs> <laughs> People who are hacking code, white hats. Yeah, and, and it's wonderful. Out of five final contestants that had, had something to, you know, to propose, you know, they made their pitches, four of them dealt with emergency services of one type or another. And they were all, you know, all interested in, and they're all based on location. So there's plenty of people who are ready to, to hack these solutions, but they become applications because that's what coders can do by themselves. And somebody here a number of years ago asked in a sort of pugilistic way, how do you distinguish between a service and an application? And that's what we're talking about. We were looking for a service, and I, I love Henning's idea of the, the people who can solve this have to decide that they have the will and, and that they have a solution that is a service. And uh, then a lot of the wonderful, ingenious you know, things people were, were developing applications for become part of, uh, they, can, they can use the common resource to provide even more services based on that common common set of, of data. It's, but hacking is the hackathons, which there's another one on this campus this Friday and Saturday. And it's a first net hackathon for you know for for uh, solutions for for first responders. And it's sponsored by AT and T. And again we're looking for all the innovation that you can pack into an application, but what we're missing is the service. And, and I kind of want to go back to what I kind of opened up with then as well, too, is that I think as these, the hackers are putting these things together, we need to make sure that they're ecosystem aware so that it's not just a matter of how do I get a bit of information from the emergency caller to the call taker, but how do I have the ability to route that through the entire network? How do I ultimately get it in the hands of the first responder? And that's, that's where a lot of the problems come in. A lot of the over-the-top apps look at it and say, I can do this one small piece of it, but that's great. That's just the start of the flow. Um, it, it has to be, there has to be some way to scale it and extend it throughout the rest of the network. And again, make it scalable yep. at, a, at a global level, which is, that's where a lot of the problems come in. We get more of the, more and more of these, well, I can talk to you on, on, on 
I can do video with you on FaceTime as long as you got an Apple and I got an Apple, or we can do Skype as long as we both have Skype accounts, and, and we keep creating all of these silos that kill us. And so is it, but go ahead. just one more thing that, that if you're now putting information in a database and I can tag that call, then the first responder and the dispatcher and anybody else who needs to can look at that data if it's there. I mean, we have now for our buildings, we have maps associated with our X, Y, and floor coordinates. And anybody, I mean, it could be the first responder, it could be the, the dispatch person, anybody who needs that information. We were also thinking in this regard exactly to that question. So my firefighters, where are they? Why can't I put these beacons on them? And why can't I myself be like a gateway? And why can't I be, I can invert my, my whole paradigm. Right? My well, there's whole, inherent yeah. data, too. If I send five firefighters this way and I have five of them coming back, something's wrong. That's artificial intelligence input. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can do all this, but we're yeah. lacking. So I, I want to help you stay on time today. I know we got started a little bit Here late. He is. <laughs> the guy with the hook. Got started a little <laughs> bit late because of someone went a little over. <laughs> it was well worth it. So we'll take the last few minutes here. Just wrap up for two minutes um, with your thoughts. Yeah, so you know, just to pick up on what Mike said, is the notion I, I, we should think more broadly uh, about emergency-related location in general. Um, because the financial incentives in the 911 system just don't seem to exist anymore, they all kind of negative incentives as in is incentive not to, to not do more than you absolutely positively have to uh, and since the bar for what you have to do given the current political environment keeps getting lowered as opposed to getting raised uh, in many parts at least uh, is we need to think more broadly can we envision a location that allows flexibility on how the location enters the system flexibility on what it can be used for, not just 911 calls, but also other type of well, locations with privacy protections in place uh, in that. And can we finally get enough interested people together who are willing to bypass some of the existing gatekeepers? Uh, in that? And so the challenge, I think, for the next year or two is, is there a coalition of the willing uh, that will actually be able to say, here, uh, we got ideas now, we got some um, kind of prototypes that have shown what we can do, some of the Apple and Google stuff, the AML stuff, whatever it happens to be. Um, we got emerging IP-based piece apps that have the ability to do software in a way that is different than what we were able to do with alley modem type of models that we were constrained by where you could only have one modem connection at a time. That was really was all you could do in that. And so it's time to, and this is the time to actually do this more in a coordinated way. So I'm hoping that maybe that will happen, that a number of entities, and with the MLTS authorization, that might also help, is, is uh, and maybe the NEAD having deadlines, and the Z-axis deadlines coming up, that there may actually be an opportunity to say, hey, let's, let's think bigger as opposed to let's think kind of mini hack here one app at a time, kind of. If you haven't seen it, look at the XKZD uh, uh, um, comic about uh, the various apps that I, I communicate for FaceTime versus whatever, and that captures very nicely. Thanks. Carol? Yeah, I think we've talked about the things we need to talk about here. And I've seen a lot of hackathons, and I, of course, teach projects, so my students are all writing code that is crying out for some solution that they can donate this material to or that, that w their, their applications will be part, part of, of, of this solution. But it, it's almost sad to see it's everybody is doing this as if I'm going to, you know, I'm going to provide this service and somebody's going to somehow magically pay for this service and now what we need is all that Creativity, and I think the hackathons are great because we're at the we're at that point 
where everybody has to try things out. But there, what we lack, what we're lacking is the next level of, and I loved Henning's expression for it, the, the coalition of the willing. I so it. I say let's get the coalition of the willing. Great. Thank you, Carol. Mr. Grady. I, I think Henning's got the key point here, really. There's, there's going to be adva continued advances in public safety at the state legislative level and at the local deployment level that's going to make uh, innovation more practical and more possible. You're starting to see some more stabilized funding models. Even Illinois now went three years without rating the fund. So you've got some real <laughs> breakthroughs that are coming here. And, uh, New I, Jersey made up for it. <laughs> yeah, of course they did. But I, I, my point is I think that as, you know, as, as other elements of society move forward and location becomes more known to them and more important to them, I think they're gonna, there's going to be an expectation. I gave a talk at a governor's conference a couple of months ago and highlighted the states that had no comprehensive program to improve public safety in their states. It was horribly, it wasn't well received at all. I about got booed off the stage. But uh, it was interesting because now we've seen a number of those governors come back and say, we're, we're going to change this. We're going to get it out of this Department of Administration and get it anchored in something we can move forward on. When Wisconsin moves forward, we're really ready for change. Great. From the man who's got the, the coolest playground in the world, the Disaster Center down at Texas A&M. Yeah, you know, it's been, it's been, on one hand, real rewarding to be working in the space for a long time. Unfortunately, it's also been pretty frustrating. I mean, when you think about the fact that we did, you know, Penning and I did some talks up at the National Press Club 14, 15 years ago, talking about where this is all going to go, and you know, we're pretty much operating at glacial speed right now. So, and um, unfortunately, we've got some significant. Um, service providers or companies that have a strong financial incentive and in not seeing things change. Um, and until we figure out a way to bust that, um, you know, there's a lot of different people working at it at the federal level from a number of different agencies. Uh, unfortunately, you know, again, my opinion personally, and you got to watch what I'm saying here because I have a part-time appointment within one of the agencies right now, is that um, there's not as much of a focused issue from all of the agencies working together on, on a single cause. It seems like everybody's kind of doing their own thing, doing wonderful things, but um, not a lot of coordination between the agencies at the federal level. And then, of course, at the state levels, again, we've got great things going on within the states, but not as much collaboration between the states as there could be as, as well. So, um, and then, like I said, on the other side, we have, we keep hitting this 800-pound gorilla wall that, that, that work works against us. So not wanting to start, you know, not wanting to end the session on a very, very downbeat note or anything <laughs> like that. But, you know, I, I think exactly Henning's, I yeah. Yeah. Henning, Henning's idea of putting together a coalition that looks at this and says, all right, you know, yeah, there's walls up there, there's things to deal with, let's figure out how, how to get it done. I think we would get a lot of support from the federal agencies because they're, again, they're, their hearts are in the right places, their minds are in the right places. A lot of times their hands are tied, though, so that's, you know, we can figure out ways to get around some of that. And Great. that typically takes grassroots effort. By the time, if you can get something out there that the citizens care about, then in essence, politicians will follow. Thanks very much.